Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the evening service of the Center Reach Bible Church. I know for those listening online, we started a little late, and the reason why that's going to happen in the future is that uh, because of Facebook, they're really giving churches a hard time, and they're really clipping our wings with a lot of different things. Uh, that is upsetting. Uh, but uh, we won't be able to be showing the music. So the music will be, the worship time will be before the message, and the worship time will be after the message, but it won't be on the camera. Uh, so uh, we just took our offering here tonight. If you'd like to give to the Center Beach Bible Church, uh, you can go to our webpage, www.cbctruth.com, and you can give online and uh, do your sacrificial giving to the Lord. But uh, we want to get right to the study tonight. Uh, in Psalm 107, and uh, you can turn in there, Psalm 107, and uh, if you were following us on Facebook, you realize that I, uh, I put a little introduction, a personal introduction uh, about this message, and uh, uh, I guess we'll find out if it was of me or of God tonight, uh, because uh, I felt real strongly about uh, what I was going to say tonight so strongly that um, I wanted to prime people to listen tonight because this is something very important. And I, and I said in the introduction uh, that we posted for a couple of days, you know, every pastor thinks his sermons are the greatest and you got to hear what I have to say. I don't think that. I don't think my sermons are the greatest and you don't got to hear what I have to say. Uh, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I feel like this is important. And I, and I think tonight, uh, I don't know, you decide. Uh, let the Holy Spirit decide if you feel that this is important. I think this is one of the most important things that I have learned just recently uh, that really hit me like a ton of bricks. And, and I will promise you this, this is going to be uncomfortable tonight because it's going to ask you uh, to make a decision in your life, or to ask yourself an uncomfortable question about your walk with Jesus Christ. And it's something that God has been asking me. And uh, it's interesting how it all unfolded through the week, and I put a lot of prayer into it. Uh, actually, the, the ending of this message, I already had it written out, and last night, I had another one of those nights where I was pacing the floor, couldn't sleep, and uh, I changed the ending because I felt that I was going in the wrong direction with the ending. So uh, it'll be interesting tonight. So uh, with that all being said, uh, I'll say hi to my uh, our Facebook friends, our YouTube friends, our Riverhead Raceway friends. Love all you guys and girls out there. Uh, those who are listening online, please don't forget to share this message if you like it. Uh, if you can, please go to our YouTube page, Center Reach Bible Church YouTube. Please click the subscribe button. It has nothing to do with making any money. It's not what we're doing. Uh, I just want to be able to get that word out to a larger audience. And Facebook is really uh, not allowing us to do that. They won't even let us boost our messages anymore for some reason. So uh, I don't know what's going on with that. But God will boost the message and he will take it where it needs to go. So uh, Psalm 107 verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day, Lord. It was a great day for our little country church today. Um, the Holy Spirit was all around, Father, and I, and I found it interesting, Lord. There was a day with, that we probably had the... Uh, weakest amount of worship, we had a ukulele, okay? We had a ukulele, and that's all we had. And I found, Lord, that after the message, people weren't really too concerned with the music. It was beautiful, but it was the word that they wanted to hear. And I heard somebody say to me, what was very profound, Father, was that, you know what? Music is good for a time, and it's good to worship, but these days, we need to hear the word. The word is what is going to get us through. And, uh, you know, we will continue, Lord, to have worship. And it'll be big worship, small worship. But at the end of the day, it's what your word has to say that's going to get us through. And I pray tonight, truly, Father, thy Holy Spirit, 
and your presence would be felt and direct me of what I should say and what I should not say. Uh, in these days in which we live, uh, that this message would clarify something that we had so desperately gotten wrong. Desperately gotten wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this is part two of Psalm 107. If you've been here for a while, we've been going through the book of Psalms since 2012. Very interesting, long time. And uh, we're up to uh, Psalm 107. This is part two. And the title is kind of strange. The title is Why, Why, Why? Don't we do what God wants us to do? Why? Okay? You know, this word that I have for tonight, I, I feel it more and more and more every day. And it's a word called frustration. But frustration with what? Not with God. I don't have frustration with God. Though that does happen in my life. I've been frustrated with God. I've been angry at God. And someone asked me the other day, is it okay if you ever get angry at God? I'm I said, no, I don't get angry at God. He has big shoulders. Okay? Many people in the Bible have gotten angry with God. Uh, he can take it. And he lets us get out what we got to get out. And then when we're done, let's look at the book of Job. Mm -hmm. Job spent many chapters whining and complaining and everybody was trying to figure out and God didn't say anything until chapter 38. Mm -hmm. And then God sometimes will say, is everybody done now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Give me a chance to speak. And then God always, right, like what does Job do? What does Job do when God spoke? He put his hand over his mouth. And he says, oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. When you hear him speak, Everything we have said is so insignificant and so unimportant. But anyway, back to this word, frustration. I feel God's frustration. That's what I'm beginning to feel. Frustration with us. And if you don't think God ever gets frustrated with his people and his creation, well, he does. And you can hold in Psalm 107, and in Matthew 23, 37, this is a perfect illustration of Jesus Christ saying, you know, if you just did what I wanted, you could avoid so much. I have so much to give you. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. <clears throat> Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And what does it say? But ye would not. You didn't want it. And what's the result? Verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. What does that mean? Empty. Empty of all that I am. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And he's speaking to Israel there. Because that's what Israel needs to do. They need to say that today. But we need to say that. And God is waiting for us. God, when are you going to do something? God says, I'm waiting for you to do something. Now, over the years... Uh, it's been apparent. I know my sermons and my teachings that I do can sound redundant. I've been criticized many times, uh, especially pre-2020, of my heavy-handed preaching and not always up, up, up all the time. But, you know, I don't know. I have this thing about warning. Uh, Noah warned people. John the Baptizer warned people. Jeremiah warned people. Ezekiel warned people. The whole Bible is a warning. And no one wants warning. And I know it sounds like I say the same thing over and over again. And there have been times when I said, maybe I am saying the same things over and over again. And people have said, you know, Pastor, I'm not coming here no more. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And I really would say, God, maybe... Maybe I need to lighten up. Maybe I'm missing something. 
And, and I would try, and I just couldn't lighten up. But I know that those words make a lot more sense today than they ever did before. And I know why. Now, the reason why, now this is, I'm going to give you an example. The reason why people don't want to hear what they need to hear, because tonight you're going to hear what you absolutely need to hear. And I pray, and I forgot to give my prayer, Lord, give the winds a mighty voice that you take this message to the four corners of the galaxy. Because I know this message is of you. But you know why people don't want to hear these messages? And I'll give you an example. Say you want to renovate your home. We all do. It's a big thing. Everybody's renovating and expanding. And you want to put, well, you get, you get a plan. You get excited. I know this, uh, my, uh, my one son, Aaron, he works for a building company, Building Supply. And he says they've just been, just really, so many people are just doing stuff. I guess with all the, with the shutdowns and everything, the extra money, people are putting extensions and new rugs. And they're just expanding everything. So let's just say that's you, and you want new windows, you want new paint, you want a hot tub, you say, this is the time, put the pool in, central air, central vacuum system. But when you go to the honest contractor, he keeps telling you why. No, none of those things can be done yet. Until what? Until you have a foundation that can sustain them. Why put all of that on top of a house that can't hold it? You don't put new windows in when the floor is rotted. And that's what we want to do all the times in our lives. You see, nothing else matters until the foundation can handle it. It's all wasted delusionism. Now, you could find a contractor that will sell you whatever you want. And you can find a pastor that will sell you whatever you want. Okay? And that's what many do today. Okay? But there's an old saying. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Okay? And I think that's what's been happening over the years. And, you know, the church has just been selling the people... We're going to put lipstick on you, and you're going to feel great, and you're going to look great, but you've got no substance. Nothing is there to hold that up. You can't have the happiness without the foundation. And you can't build upon your house with all the doodads that you want if the core is rotted. Because, people, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters if the foundation cannot sustain the building. Now, this message tonight is going to come from the annoying contractor, the annoying pastor, okay? Um, and this is a common thing, and I'm not, you know, please, Father, let me not think I'm anything more than I'm not. I'm not. But I, I, I know it's been a common thing that people have left this church many times because of me. Uh, because they don't like it. And they don't want to hear it. And uh, there's plenty of places to go to hear whatever you want to hear. Uh, because I tell you, friends, telling you every Sunday how to be happy in Christ and all the things that God has planned for you, which He does, there is joy. Well, the Bible says in Christ your joy, you will have a joy and your joy will be full. I don't deny any of those things. God has, as we read this morning, okay, the heart has not seen or the ear heard what God has prepared for those who trust in Him. Right? Is that still on? Okay, we're still on there. But you can't have those things until your foundation can sustain them. Right? It's like, you know, you you know, you get a car and you know, I remember as a kid, every time I, I bought a new car, a, a used car, you know what I do? The first thing I do is put a nice stereo in it. 
engines burning oil, needs new tires. And my father would go, what are you putting? You, the first money you get, what do you do? I want a nice stereo. I want the best stereo, the best speakers. I want to listen to my music. But you should have bought tires. You know, you should have maybe got a tune-up first. It needs brakes. But isn't that what we do? We want everything but the important things that get us through life. You know what? You can build upon that. You know, you know, fix the car, get the foundation good, make sure mechanically it's sound, and then ask, you know, if you ask me, I'm the first guy to add all kinds of doodads to my cars. I got doodads all over the place. But not until I don't do them until what's underneath is dependable and I can trust. But anyway, I'm going to leave that point right now because we're going to get back to that point because we have two important points tonight that we are going to make and hopefully they dovetail together at the end here. So let's get back to our title again. Why, why, why? Why, why? Why is God, I believe, so frustrated with us? And the point is, people, we should be as frustrated with ourselves as God is frustrated with us. And the, and the amazing thing is, is we're not frustrated with ourselves. Because, people, if we know what the problem is in our lives and in our world, then why? Why, why do we not do it? Why don't we do what God says? I've said this a hundred times. Everything we need to do to save, to save the world, to save the nations, to save your family, to save your business, to save your soul, to save your family, it's all in here. God tells us what to do. Everything that's going on. And praise God, you know, we, we saw some glimmers of hope yesterday with those rallies and stuff in Washington. It's a good thing. Okay? Praying for our nation. No politics, just praying for the nation. Repenting. Right? It's a good thing. Give them thumbs up for that. That's one of the one of the things I, I if I could have, I would have went to. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother uh, ex elder Rich and Joan were there. They went all the way there to be there. Uh, but getting back to the point, God tells us what to do. He tells us how to live our lives. But we don't do it, and I want to ask the question why, and I'm going to tell you two answers later. And the answer that I, I had originally wasn't quite the answer that I think God, I actually realized it wasn't really the answer, and God changed it. I thought I knew the answer, and then he changed my mind, and you'll hear that at the end of this message. So anyway, you heard, if anybody was here this morning, Okay, if you didn't hear the message this morning, the tool, you know, the toolbox series, we talked about trust. Okay, and I and I spoke a lot about 2019. This has been really heavy on my heart, which all of a sudden has been marked as one of the best years we ever had. 2019, wow, just a great year. I wish we could go back there. Everybody wants to go back. You see all the little clever things on Facebook and social media, you know, can we skip this year? Everything was so better back then. Why can't we do it? But what we didn't realize, and some of this is going to, you know, cover over what we spoke about this morning. What we didn't realize was, is that maybe we thought 2019 was a great year, but it wasn't. And I believe it's why we've been granted 2020. Because we never saw what was wrong. We thought 2019 was the good normal. And if you ask most people, they all want that back. They want that normal back. But it wasn't good. And it is the reason why God had had enough. And when God is trying to show us things, he doesn't give us things, he takes things away. So all you have left is him. Because I'll tell you how bad 2019 was. Because God wasn't in all of our hearts. 
God wasn't in our schools. He wasn't in the government. He wasn't in our passions. He wasn't in our possessions. He wasn't in our hobbies. He wasn't even in our churches. And we didn't even know it. Now I want you to really, really listen. It's as if we really thought life in 2019 was just fine. But it was not. And we should be glad that God said, enough. Enough. You know, as, as, as churches and talking to other pastors, what do we every year trying to get people excited about Jesus? Trying to get people excited about Jesus. People aren't excited about Jesus. They're excited about maybe what he can do for them. They're excited about programs. They're excited about all the good things and the love he's going to bring and this he's going to do in my life. But they're not excited about him. And I believe God says enough of this delusional living that the world and the church has been living in. Because God, I truly believe, and I'll show you scriptures, is saying, I was not your everything. And that's going to be one point tonight. Really, is God our everything? Because people, he's not. You know what was our everything? Our gyms. The health clubs. Okay, interesting. God says no more of those. Restaurants. It's amazing how we were so desperate for restaurants. We can't live without our restaurants. It's one of the things. It's really bad. You know, it's one thing, you know, war and famine, but you shut down the restaurants. This is a big problem. Uh, this is like, I draw the line. My life is over. Our concerts were where we went to get lifted up. Our sports is where we felt rejuvenation and excitement. Our hobbies were everything. Our lawns were important. Isn't it funny? You don't care about your lawn as much this year. Did last year? Who cares? Our kids' little league teams and, and little Johnny wasn't put on the first line of the batting thing. This is unacceptable. Our bank account was everything. Our cars were everything. And our homes were everything. And our petty causes that we marched for and thought were so important were everything. But God says, but I was not. I was not fully. Everything in your life in the desire, in the level that I desire. So we said, oh God, you were very important. Yet yeah, your level of importance, not my level of importance. Because I want all of you. Or I don't want any of you. Church was dead. Church was a party for the people. It was never a celebration of Jesus Christ. Example, and you've heard this before, and you want to hold in some. 107 in Revelation 3:14. You've heard this before, but people, it comes to life like it has never come before. This is 2020. This is what Jesus is talking about. Okay, he's talking about the last days of the church age, what it will be like, and he describes it to a T. Why what happened in 2020 needed to happen. In Revelation 3.14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. And many people believe each church has an angel, but some people believe it's actually talking to the pastors of each one of those churches. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Now, this is Jesus talking to a church. The state of the church. Right before he returns. You are neither cold nor are you hot. I wish you were one of them. I wish you were hot or cold. 
So then because you are lukewarm, and many different translations say this another way, either cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will vomit you. And what Jesus is saying, I can't keep you down. I taste you and it's disgusting to me. Why? Why would Jesus say this? Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich. That's what we were saying in 2019. I know plenty of pastors, plenty of churches, we're doing great. We are putting extensions on. We, the band is exploding. We've got 37 people on the stage. We are doing things. The worship is over the top. The kids are coming. The light show is there. We are there. Jesus says, because you say I am rich and I increase with goods and have need of nothing, and you know not that you are wretched. Jesus is calling the church wretched to him and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So Jesus says in verse 18, he's got some advice, okay? He's got some advice, and we can apply this advice today. I counsel thee to buy of me, okay? Not some of this program or that program or this new packet that someone's trying to sell to your church. Take my advice. I think we should take God's advice. I think the creator of the cosmos might know what we need to do. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. The things I'm going to tell you, he's not talking about gold, he's talking about my wisdom. It's tried, it's tested, it works. That thou mayest be rich, not financially rich, not what he's talking about, spiritually rich, and white raiment. You know what? What does that signify? Purity. He's saying you guys are not able to wear white because you're disgusting. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And what does Jesus say? Anoint your eyes with eyes salve that you may see. Jesus is saying this church, the church universal at the end, towards the end, is going to think they are so perfect holy, righteous, they've got the system, they've got the business of running the church like a corporation. That's what the church has come to become today. A big corporation. And they don't even see that Jesus isn't even in the house. He's not even there. Oh no, you've got to come. Spirits, it's just unbelievable. People are falling down, flipping over loops and over his Gold dust coming from the sea. Jesus says, I am not there. It's all manufactured by you. Open your eyes. You may see. But this is the, you know, this God is always in love. People, someone asked me the other day, you know, they said, I, I, I think I'm a lukewarm Christian. Is Jesus going to spit me out of, out, of, out, of, uh, out of his mouth? And I said to the person, if you feel that way, you're not a lukewarm. I said, you're not a lukewarm Christian. I know what. You're not lukewarm. And this is not talking about losing salvation, okay? Because he's talking to a church. As many as I love, look at verse 19. I rebuke and I chasten. See, he's a good father. If we're doing something wrong, he doesn't say, well, just burn yourself out. He does something. He shakes. He shakes us. And he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Change, look and do a self-introspection and say, Lord, what have I missed? What am I doing wrong? Why, I, I thought I had it all right. You know, I thought we're going in the right direction. I said, what am I doing wrong? He says, turn, repent. Noeha means to have a change of mind about your sins and about yourself. Not other people's, yours and mine. And then Jesus says this amazing scripture, verse 20, we use it a lot, and this is one of those times that I've shared before, you know, when you study the word of God, you can study it by interpretation, and you can use it in application. Now, Revelation 3.20 is used a lot as a salvation verse 
to bring people to Christ, but it's not a salvation verse. Okay? It's saying something very interesting. Jesus says in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and him with me. So yeah, it seems like salvation, and you can apply it to salvation. But what's really mind-blowing is what Jesus is saying. He goes, I'm not in the Laodicean church. I'm outside. I'm actually, can I come into your service? No, Jesus, we've got this down. We've got a whole system. We've got a stage crew. We really don't have time for you. You just stay up. But I'd like to come in and join you guys. No, no. Jesus said, can I come in to your service? Can I join you? Because if you let me in, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And I will come into him and sup with him and him with me. And it says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Then he says, always these great words, he who has an ear to hear. You have an ear? God says, I gave you two. If you have an ear, then you're responsible to hear what I'm saying. And he says, let him hear what the Spirit, uppercase as Holy Spirit, is, that's how we know it's speaking to believers, is saying to the churches, okay? And when it says to overcome what? Overcome the deception. Overcome the, 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 the blinders that have been on our eyes. Open up your eyes and look around and realize what we have really been living for has been self. We have not been living for Christ at the level he demands. Jesus is saying in Revelation 3 that the church in the last, last days has lost its purpose. And their happiness has become the goal instead of God's happiness. Do you see that? The church's happiness became the goal instead of God's happiness. You kicked me out of my own church, and so I will shake you, like our sister Ellen always says, I will shake you, and I will wake you until you are naked and broken and exposed. People, we need a great exposing, and I believe 2020 has been a great exposing of the heart of man. It is desperately wicked who can know it. And the heart of the church, everybody thought they really trusted in God. God was everything to them. And God says, really, I'll take away everything, and we'll see who stands. All of a sudden, like I said this morning, all we got is God. Yeah, that's what you got is me. And all of a sudden, it's not enough. And God says, you see, that's the point. That's the point of all this. Now, I'm sure whatever's going on in the world, I don't know all the ins and outs. I'm sure God is allowing many different things. I don't know what he has up his sleeve. But whatever he's allowing, he's allowing for a purpose. And like I said this morning, it will be good for those who have ears to hear. Which brings us to our scripture tonight and back to our title, Why, Why, Why? Why didn't we see the dark road we were going down in 2019? And will we learn anything in 2020? People, I don't know about you, I've learned a lot this year. Man, I have learned so much. I mean, we should really do a, a night of what, yeah. what good things have come about in 2020. I tell you, my walk with God is completely different than it was before March. Because it really shook and woke me up. And it woke up a lot of people. And I've learned a lot of things, but we still come to the question, if we're learning a lot of things, why aren't we doing, taking what we've learned, and do something with it? 
Do what God says. In Psalm 107, verse 8, listen to the psalmist. Oh, you see the passion. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for what? For the new car he gives you? For the new house? For his goodness and his wonderful works unto the children of men. And if you say, I don't see any wonderful works, then you don't see. For what does God do? He, this is important, look at this. If you have your own Bible, circle this. Who, satisf who satisfies the longing soul? He does. He satisfies the longing soul, and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. And it doesn't, see, we're learning, it doesn't come in the form of a nice restaurant. I can't, some people say, I can't go see my favorite band at a concert anymore. This is horrible. I can't go to the game. Damn the games. Verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. He's saying those people, they are sitting in darkness that don't see this. They're bound in affliction that they brought upon themselves because they looked to everything else to be their joy and their peace and their happy life. Now I want to stop at this point here and I want you to hold because I don't think any of us are still going to get this until we understand really where our true love is. Until we understand this and we're going to go to Hebrews 11.13 and we read that, we read this this morning and it really has been on my heart. Hebrews 11.13 it's a, the faith chapter and it's interesting when you read that chapter it talks about, you know, uh, dead were brought to life, all the things that, you know, were done because people had faith but some people who trusted in God didn't get in this life what they waited for and they were okay with it. Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed. We need to confess that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Okay. Our sister Donna and Pete my new elder, Pete's new elder and elder wife there, okay, when they came and made the decision after we had them pray. And uh, Donna, your words just piercing my heart ever since you said them. She said, we went away to seek God, you know, to seek wisdom, went up into the mountains and said, maybe we're just going to run away. And then they realized we are dead to this world. And some people say, well, that's a horrible thing. No. That's exactly where you need to come to. Amen. This world cannot be everything. You've got to say it doesn't matter anymore. What does this say? They confessed that they were strangers. Do you ever feel, I tell you, like if, as a Christian, I feel like I'm a stranger on this planet. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm living in another world, like I'm like in bizarro world. Because the people, that I'm, you know, you, you meet and I say, wow, I don't even feel like I belong in this place. This is a crazy world that I never realized how much I didn't belong. Why? Because we're pilgrims on the earth. Verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They want a great country. Egypt, you know, I mean, the Hebrews wanted their own country. They wanted their own place for themselves. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have an opportunity to return. But now, being enlightened, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. You know, on this planet, people are ashamed to mention God. 
Okay, I saw a picture. I've seen all these pictures. I know places like California and Oregon. These young people with signs, "God not welcomed here." Okay, they have horns. They're wearing this stuff. They think it's a joke. We don't want you here. Well, I think he's leaving them. Okay, God will not stay where he's not wanted. They don't want him. And if you mention him, you're a big problem to this world. I want to be in a place where God is not ashamed to be called my God. And he has prepared a city for Israel who come to Christ and through Messiah and faith and for the church. <clears throat> now, I want to make, this is the big point of the, of the message tonight that I was building up to. And this is the mind-blowing truth that's going to make you very uncomfortable. And it's going to scare you. And it makes me think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and wanted to follow him, but could not commit. Example, the other day, talking to a person, I'm not going to mention male or female, I don't want anyone to know who they were, but been seeing this person, Christian, coming to see me for a while, and uh, they are completely petrified of COVID. Okay? I'm talking just, they cannot exist. It, it's just really bad. And I want to do a, a disclaimer here. I'm not talking about pro-masks, con masks, whatever. I'm not talking about where, if you should wear masks or not. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, you can get to a point, now this particular person, okay, the first time I, I, I saw them, they stopped, I haven't seen them in years, they, they stayed way, they, they wouldn't even, they were like, I'm like 40 feet from them, I'm not even kidding. Hi, Basta, you know, stay back. And I can tell this person was really upset. And I have to say, praise God, they're doing much better. They're coming to see me, and, and but this person, is so petrified. They haven't left their house since March, other than, I mean, just now, recently, they're getting out. They're locked down. It hasn't worked, won't go to work, won't go anywhere. Completely, I can't. I can't see anyone. I can't go anywhere. I can't touch anything. And it's destroyed. It's running out of money. You can't live in your home and have stuff sent to you all day long. You've got to live. So I asked the person, because obviously the COVID thing is, is really, and the person kept telling me, you know, they're going to, you know, as soon as the, the cure comes out, uh, I'm going to be right back out. And I kept, well, why, why we don't have a cure? No, it's coming, definitely. I will, how about if it doesn't? No, it's coming. It's going to come. And when it does, I'll be back out again. So I asked this person, I said, what are you really afraid of? And he said, the person said, getting sick, getting COVID. And I said, no, you're not. That's not what you're afraid of. You're afraid of dying. Because have you ever been sick before? Yeah, a lot of times. Why is this different? Because you're afraid of dying. And I stopped and I asked the person, friend, what is your greatest joy in life? What do you want to, well, I want to get back to going out, having fun, back to work, meeting people, doing, I have a lot of plans, I like to do this, I like to do that, I have a lot of things. And I said, but what is your greatest joy? So I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to answer me. What is the most important thing in your life? Living here and getting your old fun life back or being with Jesus Christ in glory? And it blew his mind. 
So you tell me you love Jesus Christ. Why are you afraid to go there? No. And it reminded me of the rich young ruler. You see, the greatest thing about life, people, is to many people living this one. Doing what all we want to do. But to go to be with Jesus, that's not on the top of anyone's list. To which I told the young person, you must get to the place where living is losing and dying is winning. Now that sounds crazy. That sounds really crazy. Because once you get there, the fear of dying is gone. That one thing that you're afraid of, you don't have to worry about anymore. Because I told this person, don't you understand? And I told them, I don't care. You can wear a mask anywhere you go. You can gloves on, you put, we'll put you in a suit. I said, but why won't you go? Because this person still with, I said, get an N95. I said, I have no problem with that. But you still won't go. Why? Everyone's wearing a mask. You're wearing a mask. Why? Pray. Why? Of what? Recently, me and my wife were praying. I mean, it's, it's really brought us closer to God, brought us closer to each other. We've really come to this conclusion. We've never said this. I have for a while. My wife finally said it. That to die in Christ is gain. You've got to get to that point, people. And this sounds crazy. And I told this, this person I was talking to. I said, I'll tell you something. I cannot wait to die and be with Jesus Christ. And if there's anything in this life that you feel is better than that, then Jesus Christ isn't anything to you. Because really think about it. Because well, you know, I tell you, if someone off your parents is coming, we're going to take you on a round-the-world Jeep trip. We're going to give you everything. And, and maybe God would say, listen, this is Pastor Scott. I'm going to give you a year of everything you could ever want. It's going to be an awesome year. Or you can come home with me right now. What would you choose? By that choice, you determine what you really love. So I told this person, hey, you know, you have somebody you're just seeing. Well, and the person has not seen them. They're afraid to go see that person that they're seeing. What are you telling that person, okay? I really love you, but I don't want to be near you. I want to stay away from you as long as I can because there are other things more important to me. You've got to get to the point that there is nothing. How many Christians say, well, I just want to see my kids graduate, and I want to see my grandchildren. Is that better than Jesus Christ? Because I have to tell you, I told this person, you have to understand, you don't want to go see Jesus yet. But you got a lot of stuff. Do you understand? You're going to go spend eternity with the God of the Adam. You're going to find out Everything, where everything came from, what his plans are. You're going to sit at his feet. If there's anything in this life you want more, then Jesus is not your God. He's not what you love. He's something that's good to keep in your back pocket. There's an old story of a pastor said on Sunday morning. How many people want to go to see Jesus when they die? And they all say, we do. He goes, how many want to leave right now? <laughs> well, not me, Andrew, but said, you know. Well, I got a couple of things I want to do, you know. And it's in, it's an interesting experiment, you know, because if Jesus and God in heaven is great for the future when I get really old and I'm done with all the stuff I want to do. It's like a retirement home for us, but it's not. We really don't want. We don't want to go to heaven, people. We don't want to spend time with Jesus. 
We don't. We want to stay here. And we want to do what we want to do. And I, I, I didn't always feel that way, but I tell you, if the Lord is my witness, okay, I say, every Lord, let thy rapture come today. I have nothing here. Nothing here that I want more than being with, with you. Now, it, but honestly, I don't want loved ones to go because, you know, why do I not want that? You know, I don't, you know, I'm having to be my wife. You know what? You better go, be, you know, I, mean, I better go before you because I ain't getting left behind here. I better die first because I ain't going to be alone. You know, that's why we don't want to, I mean, I don't want anybody to die. I don't. But when it comes to me, I have nothing here. I love you guys. I love serving God. I love all this stuff. I love my Jeeps. I love going on trips. But I tell you, at the end of the day, God's asking you, what do you really love? Where do you really want to be? He's really trying our love muscle. People, this is scriptural. You might say, that's really, you Christians are way out. That, that's way out. Because people are not talking suicide here. Well, let's just all kill ourselves so we can be with God. No, it's not at all. Because remember Paul? Remember Paul? What did he say? He goes, you know what? If I had a choice, I'd be with God right now. He got up there. He saw the third heaven. He says, but it's expedient that I stay. People, if God, no one determines when we're going to die but God. And I, and I told this person I was counseling, I said, friend, you can beat COVID. Next week they can get your, your cure and you'll be, you think you'll be happy? You'll be afraid of something else again. And do you think you've beaten death? Do you think you've escaped it? It is appointed unto men once to die, it says in Hebrews. And after that, the judgment. God determines you can build yourself in a lead box with all kind of germ protection things. It doesn't matter. If God's going to take me tomorrow and he wants to choose, he, if he wants to use COVID, use COVID. If he wants to use a Mack truck hitting me as I drive down the street, that's up to him. I have no say over that. What I do have to do is this is the day that the Lord has given to me. What am I going to do with it? What's going to be important to me? It's important stuff. Philippians 1.21, just in case you think I'm crazy. Paul says, for to me to live in Christ. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That's exactly what I said. Oh, you've got to be crazy. Don't you want to have fun with you know, fishing again and do all this? You know, I've seen, I've been with Jesus. I want to be with him. There is nothing. And you know what frustrates me? And you know the world. And I've said this before. When you talk to the world about heaven, you know what heaven is for them? It's all about them. What they're all going to be doing. Joe's going to be golfing. Bob's going to be fishing. Going there has nothing to do with being in the presence of Jesus. It's about this great retirement they're going to have. Riding the horses and playing with their dogs and, you know, having the fun. It's going to be a party up there. God being there is incidental to them. No, he's everything. He's the first person absent from the body, present with the Lord. First thing you're going to see, if you're bored... Worshiping, and I don't really want to get too much into this Jesus thing. If you're bored with him now, I got bad news for you. You're going to be in heaven day and night, and when you see him, you're going to be worshiping. What are the angels doing right now, day and night, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord, thy low God Almighty, who was who is, and who is the common. There's nothing else to say. You're not going to be going up there. And by the way, God, you know, remember back in 1935, you know, you really did me a bad deal. You're not going to be saying that. You're going to be in awe going, why did I want to stay down there any longer? Why? Because you want other people to go there too. 
and I don't want to go until my work is done. And people, you, if you want to stay living longer, serve God harder. Because if your purpose is God's purpose, he's going to make sure you stay alive and you stay healthy and you're able to do what you're supposed to do for him. If you live for yourself, I think you're risking it. I think you're risking it. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? It's gone. Grave, where's the victory? People, we don't lose when we die. Everybody thinks that, well, poor God, just died. Somebody just told me, uh, a pastor friend told me that a pastor that he knows passed away of COVID. And, and, I, and I thought for a second, wow, that, but wait a minute, maybe that's his reward. He served God faithfully, and God always understand God loves us. And you know what? He wants us with Him as soon as possible. He only keeps us down here because we have work to do. When God takes a child of God home, it's because I want you with me now. There were some people in the Bible that God says, "I can't wait." Who was who was taken up? Elijah. God says, you know, and that was the first rapture. He was raptured. God says, I, I can't be without. I love Elijah. You're coming home. I want you with me. But what do we think? Well, oh, boy, God did him a deal. Bad, poor deal. Served all of his life. Now he's dead. No! He didn't lose. That's what Satan does. He makes you think that death is losing, living is winning. Not according to Scripture. And I know it's a bizarre, crazy passage. You're really blowing my mind here. I don't like that. But I tell you, once you live that way, you don't fear anything. Because the ultimate fear is death. God says, I've taken care of that. It's no longer the monster that you thought it was. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And this man, person, the other day walked away sad because this life, though they said, Jesus is everything to me, I said, I don't think so. I don't think he is. Because you've got a lot of plans that don't include him. And he actually said, Pastor, you're blowing my mind. You're blowing my mind. I have to think about this. And I know we're running a little bit late, but we're going to go late. I want you to turn to Matthew 19, 16. I want to tell you the story about the rich young ruler because people don't get this and they misunderstand what Jesus is doing. This is a very profound illustration of what Jesus wants. People, he wants him to be everything. If you gain the whole world and lose Christ, you've lost everything. In Matthew 19, 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, unto Jesus Christ, Good master, what good things shall I do? Look, he already was thinking religion. What's some good stuff that I can do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, verse 17, Why do you call me good? Jesus is so cool, isn't he? Yeah. Why, do you, why do you think I'm so good for there is none good but one, that is God. What is he? By the way, you know what he was saying? I'm God. Okay? But if thou wilt enter into life, I tell you what. Okay? Now, this is not Jesus telling you to be good to get to heaven. He's speaking to this man's heart because he knows what this man really loves. And he says, I tell you what you want to do. You want to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. And he said to him, the guy had, which one, Jesus? Jesus said, well, I'll tell you. Uh, don't kill anyone. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, Jesus picked those because he knew this guy was good with those. He had been keeping those. Because the young guy says, yep, yeah, I got it. All these things have I kept from my youth. What do I lack? Jesus says, if I could add this, I tell you what. 
If you really want to be perfect, I, I don't know, he kind of seems like he's playing with this guy. But if you really want to be perfect, sell everything that you own, give it to the poor, and then you're going to have treasure in heaven. But the real clincher was, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. Why? He had a lot of stuff. And he weighed them in the balance. Jesus, my stuff. I love Jesus. I want eternal life, but I'm not giving it up. And Jesus said unto him, said unto his disciples, he, used, he turned to his disciples, used the man as an example. Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the point here is, it had nothing to do with money. He wasn't telling the guy, give up all your money and just give up everything. He was telling him, give up what you really love. Because if you really love me, these things won't matter to you. Because he really didn't have to give up any of those things. What he had to do was give up the love of them. Remember the, one of the most misquoted scriptures? The love of money is the, money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. Money is not evil. The love of money. All that guy had to do was just say, I'll give it. I don't care. If I have it, I don't have it. Jesus needed to know that what do you really love? You don't have to give up your money. You don't have to give up anything. But what I want is your love. I want to know where your heart is. Meaning if we truly love God, we will do what he says and live like he says. And if we do, life on earth while we live will be much better. And nothing will ever scare us again. Because if we're not afraid of dying, imagine being a soldier going into battle. And you know you can't be killed because you have the super suit on. You're going to be out there in the front lines because I can't. Death doesn't affect me. I'm a super soldier. But I want to get back to our scripture here. Because we're not done here. And I haven't got to the clincher point. <laughs> oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Psalm 107, verse 8. For his goodness and for his wonderful work to the children of men. He satisfies the morning holes of the and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. But, verse 10, I want to skip that one time. But what happens to God's people in this account? Look at verse 11. It's the mistake we make over and over again. But because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the most... I don't care what you say, Jesus. I don't care what you want. I don't care what you say I need to do in my life. I don't care. Well, verse 12, therefore he brought down their hearts. He took away the joy of the things that they thought would give them joy. With labor, and they fell down, and there was none to help them. Because if Jesus isn't your joy and your hope and your trust, nothing's going to make you happy. Nothing. Do you think if, if COVID is healed all, all of a sudden and the riots are gone and everything's back, that everyone's going to be just happy and not depressed anymore? We'll go right back to whining and complaining about the weeds on our lawn. And their lawn is better than my lawn. And I want the car that they got. And my kids are driving me crazy. It, it never is going to change. But listen, and this is our hope, guys. This is truth, verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. The mercy. You wonder why God just keeps giving us chances and chances. But he does, because he's the God of grace. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. And he brought them out of darkness and out of the shadow of death, the fear of death. And he broke the band, the chains that were holding them down from truly living a joyful life on this planet. Yet we have to come to this conclusion tonight. And this is where I want us to ponder the crossroads we come to. As, again, we still haven't answered the question, why don't we just do then what God says? 
not even just as a nation, that's hard to manipulate because it's people, but in our own lives. Why don't I and you act properly when we're dealing with people, when we're dealing with our children, when we're dealing with enemies, when we're dealing with money? Why don't we just do what God says to do? Why does just that? God tells us how to live a happy life. Obey my rules, everything will just do what I do. I will do what I tell you to do. I have it all written out. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs has really life application on everything we need to do in every situation. Yeah, we need to turn, we need to repent, we need to confess. That's one thing we need to do. We need to bow down and we need to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord over all. But there's something else. And just as Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I put in there, O USA, O USA, O Scott, O Michan, O Donna. Jesus is saying the same thing. I would have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. But you didn't want to go underneath there. And because of that, your house, because of what you did, your house is left desolate. And you won't see me working in your life again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until you say, Jesus is everything to me. Nothing, nothing is more important. And this is where I, I changed my, my thought. I said, well, I thought the reason why we don't do this is, well, Maybe we just don't believe God's word. We just don't believe it. You know? But that, that might be the answer for a lot of people. But I know for you guys here, I know for myself, I do believe God's word. So that's what changed. I said, but you know what? That doesn't answer the question because I believe what God says. Do I trust? Yeah, I think I trust what God says. But I, it was last night when I was thinking about this and changed my mind and I, I really feel God saying, no, don't, that's not the answer I'm looking for. The answer of why we don't do what we should do and be happy is because we love our will more than God's. That's the answer. I really want what I want, God, more than I want what you want for my life. Because sometimes God pulls us into different places. I don't want to go there, but God, not my will be done. Thy will be done. That's the reason. People, I don't want what God wants. I want what I want. And until we can say, God, like Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Until you can get there, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to find peace. And, and, and I'm not saying I'm there at all. Because there's a lot of things I still want. <laughs> Maybe God doesn't. But we need to at least examine ourselves and say, God, what do I really want? I say I love you, but I do I really? What's the Lord's prayer? Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everybody likes to quote that, right? Well, do we do that? Lord, in my life, whatever you want for me, that's what I want. And I, I shared this with you many years ago. Before I became a pastor, I was a, in this church on the deacon board and, you know, just looking for what I was supposed to do. And someone told me about this prayer. And I said, wow, that's a kind of scary prayer. I don't think I'm ready for that prayer. And I waited a year and I, and I threw it around in my head. And one day I said, I'm going to say this prayer. And you know what the prayer was? Because until you say this, and it's a scary, and I don't suggest you do it unless you mean it. One day I said, Lord, you know what? Do whatever you have to do in my life to bring me to where you want me to be. That means, Lord, I give you carte blanche. You can have my children, my wife, my job, my health, whatever you decide to do that's going to make me into what you want me to be. 
And I tell you, it was shortly after that, that's when I went into my great depression, almost took my life, clinical depression. It was a horrible time, but boy, what a purging. And it was like, whoa, I hope I should have never said that prayer. Uh, well, God says, I'm rolling up my sleeves with you. And I'm going to start, will you let me get at you? Because you don't want my will, you want your will. And many of us never find out what we were supposed to do in life because we never... I mean, not that God needs our permission, but God still, he still, we have a free will. And he will not force us into anything. You want to serve me and love me? Because he doesn't want fake love. He doesn't want love that's, cool. okay, God, I love you. I cry, uncle, you're great. No. He goes, you want to serve me? Serve me. You want me to work in your life and point you where I want you to point you to? It's going to be some ringing of washcloths until every bit of that water is out. You pray that, and I'll get busy on you. And I'll bring you to a place in your life where I'm going to use you in ways you never dreamed. But do I trust God that much? Do I submit my will and say, it doesn't matter what I, what I want anymore, God. It doesn't matter if I get anything. It matters what you want. And people, I don't want to put you, leave you on a down here because you know what? God is so gracious. Even with all of that hard things that I went through, I've had many great times. And especially now, I mean, God's favor has just been so great. I'm, he's, you know, he's letting me play. He's giving me things I never dreamt of. He doesn't have to, but for some reason he has for a season. Uh, you know, God does reward. He's, he's pleased with children who do the right thing. And I don't always do the right thing. I, promise you that. And he's gracious with me there too. Because every time I I'm kinda of like flinching, I'm waiting for him to say, <laughs> Sometimes he does and sometimes he takes me out for ice cream, like I said. And that's his grace. Amen. And I say, God, I love this so much. I don't understand it. But why did he love David so much? Remember David is the apple of God's eye. That's why people say, I'm so bad and so, you're not worse than David. David had an affair with some woman. He killed the husband. He manipulated. It was a, the, it was, if CNN was around, they would have had a field day <laughs> with that story. David was a bad political guy. But you know, God didn't base his love on him on how good David was. He based his love on him because David loved God. And boy, when David sinned, he goes, oh, it gets you and you only have I sinned. I hate when I disappoint you because he loves God so much. Yeah. And if you love God that much, don't you think he's, well, he loves you so much? He loves you so much. He really does. <coughs> Do we love him that much? we got to work on that. I want you to think about it. I have to think about it. Yeah. Bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this this truth, Lord, it's, wow, dying is gain and living is loss, Lord. It seems like everything that's good is on this earth, but you know, I complain about everything on this earth. It's kind of a paradox. I hate it here, but I don't want to live here. But I want to stay here, and I don't want to die. But I want to be with you, but I don't want to be with you. I think you're the best in the world, and to be with you is the best thing to be. We all celebrate when someone in Christ dies. Oh, they're with the Lord now. How wonderful. But I'm glad I'm not in that casket. I'm glad I'm not, though. And, and, and I think well, there's something wrong. We, we, we're confused about something. Let us get our heads clear on this. As we live, we live unto you. And when it's time for you to call us home, that's your, that's, that's your call. And there is no gun, there is no bomb that can take us out if you say you're living. And there's no box we can hide in that can keep us alive and vaccine we can take if you say, no, you're going home. That's not our, and I'm, Father, I, I pray for this so I don't get any hate mail here. You know, we, we, we don't be foolish. I don't go lick the doorknobs of people who are sick and I don't go up to them and give them a kiss on the lips. I do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not foolish. 
I don't walk across the highway with cars running saying, God's not going to take my life. No, that's foolishness. I use the wisdom that you gave me to stay alive. I don't become a fool. I don't play on the roof and uh, have a play with death. No, Lord. I do what I'm supposed to do to watch my P's and Q's and stay healthy. But at the end of the day, it can't stop me from living, Lord. For you, choose that day and you choose our purpose. And we just need to know, Lord, what do we really care about the most? What we want to do or what you want to do through us. And when we come to that point and say, Lord, here I am, use me, it's going to be glorious. And we're going to be happy. And we're going to have peace. And we're going to have an understanding and a light on us like Moses coming down from the mountain. He had to cover his face because he glowed from being in the presence of the Lord. Father, we can glow that way. When we get to the point when we say, when we die to self, what did John the baptizer say? I must decrease, he must increase. That's a hard place to be because, you know what, Lord? I love me too much. I love me. As much as I hate me, I love me. And that's a problem. Help us, Lord, in this situation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand, guys, and we're going to close.